So, good evening, everybody. Um, great uh, to see people um, beginning to come online, he said optimistically. Um, and um, uh, just really pleased to have um, a great panel of guests with us this um, evening for tonight's Rev Talk. Um, we have um, Drew Pritchard, we've got Dominic Taylor Lane, um, Hannah Prouse, Leah um, Gilliard Watts, and Owen Johns, and of course, yours truly. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves a little because that's the best way, and I'll always get it wrong, um, but that's the vicar's prerogative. So, um, but just to say before we um, uh, kick off, um, uh, Tonight, usual um, kind of guidelines apply in terms of please, if you've got any comments or questions you would like us to feed in to the conversation, then please just put them in the comment section below uh, and we will do our best to feed in as many um, as we can um, as possible. It's great to have these guys join us this evening. I know that people are in the midst of busyness, working, uh, busy jobs, all of that stuff. So. Um, I just want to kick off by saying thank you to you five for joining in tonight and for those who are um, listening. Um, tonight is about heritage. It's about the future, um, which kind of seems ironic when you talk about heritage, but actually all that will become apparent as we um, talk. Um, so um, I'm going to ask um, if each of you would introduce yourselves. So um, Dom, would you say something about who you are? Um, why you look so attractive in our camera tonight and um, what shampoo you use, yeah. Um. Yeah, that's the joy of these headshots. I'm actually only 12 stone below this neck. Um, <laughs> the, um, I set up Association of Heritage Engineers when my youngest son, Oliver, started at the Heritage Skills Academy, uh, which is how I know the um, guys and girls at the Heritage Skills Academy. Um, it rapidly progressed um, and now covers, we cover most of heritage skills actually, uh, which kind of is demonstrated in the panel tonight. Um, Drew in particular, I'm going to mention Drew. Drew has, Drew has been in on this since the very beginning. Um, he's always given time and effort whenever it was asked for and I think he's also a very good example of you can start as an apprentice and go on to do many 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 things um, so we've um, I've just moved it on from there really so now we are talking about all sorts of heritage skills from stonemasonry right up to people rebuilding spitfires so that's me that's you. Brilliant. Thank you. Drew, would you like to just kind of um, introduce yourself, please? Okay. Well, usually I'd allow, I'd always say ladies first, but still, I, here we go. Uh, I am Drew Pritchard. I'm a full time antique dealer, um, uh, part time TV um, talking head, and a uh, ex apprentice, um, a 16 year old apprentice, where I qualified fully as a stained glass conservator, restorer, and designer. Brilliant. Thank you, Drew. Um, Hannah, could you, um, yeah, say something about yourself as we start? Thank you. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. So for the last two days, I have been the CEO of Portsmouth Naval Base Property Trust. So very much still finding my feet. Um, I've got all the buildings of the historic dockyard down at Portsmouth in my custody. Um, and I've also got an international boat building academy, which is spectacular, where we teach traditional boat building skills. Um, prior to that, I was head of national projects for English heritage. So my passion is building conservation and heritage skills in the built environment. And I've been trying to champion a collaborative approach to skills training and apprenticeships across the construction industry for the last few years. Brilliant, thank you. Leah, can I ask you? Hello, good evening. Um, I'm Leah Gilliard Watt and I'm the Operations Director at Property Bridge Cars. Um, also, I am the editor of the Jensen Owners Club magazine. Um, also, the same as Drew, I'm an ex apprentice as well. Um, I actually started my career as a legal assistant in local government. 
um, wasn't actually encouraged to sort of move towards the car industry. Um, that was my passion from, from a very, very young age, um, but moved into legal. But um, I'll, I'll carry on with that later on in the, in the chat. Thank you. And finally, Owen, um, if you could, yeah, introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so my name is Owen, Owen Johns, and uh, I'm the Development Director at uh, Heritage Skills Academy, um, which uh, Dominic has referred to, which um, trains uh, apprentices on the Heritage Engineering Technician um, course. Um, my role is quite diverse. Um, we've also just opened a second site down at Brooklyn's Museum, started training there uh, last week and this week. So uh, a little bit cold, to be honest. I'm only just warming up from spending a day down in the hangar. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're uh, running at about 100 apprentices or so. Um, um, good growth, which I think demonstrates that this, um, this industry has got a future for all of our uh, you know, apprentices, trainees, um, the skills that are needed, um, and uh, really looking to collaborate, share ideas, and um, talk about the successes, really, because I think it's really, really, really positive. I think it's really poised to grow um a, a pivotal time in everybody's lives really post post covid fingers crossed so uh yeah looking forward to talking about that this evening brilliant thank you um so i'm gonna start um with a really kind of broad brush question and maybe um uh um just pick people at random if that's okay um but but the question is why heritage what's so important about heritage why should we be talking about this so um, maybe dom if you could start um simply because you and i kind of have chatted on this a number of times um absolutely well well heritage is obviously broadly defined as what has happened in the past but what has happened in the past people have also made mistakes in the past uh, and i'm i'm a firm believer in that if you have the ability to learn from the past and not make those mistakes again, um, then heritage is a very, very positive thing. Um, I, I'm also of the opinion that there are, there are certain things that you can learn to do, which given the environment, you can't actually get to do any better. So what you want to do is encourage those people who've reached the pinnacle of those skills to, to teach other people to do it as well as them. Um, and there is, a, there is a big thing um, in America at the moment that they call knowledge management. And knowledge management is basically about managing the knowledge so that it doesn't get lost on old floppy disks or it doesn't get left in people's attics. We need to get this stuff out there. Um, and we need to we need to make heritage relevant to the future. And I think, given all the tools we have, uh, we have a very strong case for that. Mm. Anna, I mean, obviously, I'm aware you've been at your current job just two days. Um, but 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 even, I mean, you've you've outlined a a, a kind of broader and, and previous experience anyway. Mm. What for you is important about heritage, and and why? I think the need to touch base with our heritage across all of its its forms and disciplines is actually a really fundamental human need um, we intrinsically want and need that connection with our past um, something to root ourselves in sometimes it's a, a security blanket thing sometimes it's a, it's to learn from and sometimes it's just i think most people will recognize an intrinsic beauty in heritage objects or items you know that's why we have an antiques trade and we why we deem it necessary to preserve our historic buildings and and cars and things um and i think actually as the cycle the pendulum swings again and we move into a more anti-consumerist culture and mentality and greater focus on sustainability again you know looking for that permanence and something that stood the test of time is you know dare I say coming back into fashion even more um, in the built environment Her historic England released a report last year on measuring embodied carbon in existing buildings so you know, instead of having these crazy sustainability matrices where we say that something that's been built shipped from China is somehow the most sustainable building that we can produce we're actually now trying to shift the dialogue and look at things that are built using 
local materials, local trade and built a thousand years ago. And actually the embodied life cycle of that building makes it far more sustainable than the modern, you know, glass and silicon effect. Um, and we're beginning to work out how we can measure those things and therefore how we can count them and therefore how we can shift the dialogue. Um, I think it is just basically a fundamental human need. It's been shown to increase well-being across all kinds of sectors. Um, yeah, we need it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Owen, um, from your perspective, why heritage? Um, well, I think I think building on the two other points, I think it's a lot about skills development. Um, I mean, I've been in education for 23 years, um, secondary education primarily, and uh, I think through through a culture of league tables and um, you know exam factories and various things like that, you know, I think the kind of the emphasis on tr traditional skills and the need for them um, and the problem solving has been sort of almost kicked out of the, the mainstream education system. So. I think um, reconnecting with heritage and reconnecting with how things used to be done um, and, and really try and move on from the kind of plug and play generation. You know, I think Hannah's just touched on that, you know, something that is sustainable. And I think the last year and a half has proved that we need to um, be a bit more independent as a nation as well. So, you know, we need people who can fix things. We need people who can problem solve and can be creative um, and, uh, and put that back into um, UK PLC. I think it's really, really important that we really focus upon skills development and, and be proud of what we've achieved previously. Um, and I think it has come full circle. And I think we've got to revisit some of those absolutely fantastic achievements that have taken place previously and, and really build on them and be proud and proud as a nation, I think, as well. So I think building on Hannah's point there, the well-being, you know, the connection with the satisfaction on rather plug and play or click on Amazon and just get a new product through the door or actually going and fixing it or repairing it or, or sustaining a product for a much longer period of time, um, you know, a family heirloom, whatever it might be, it doesn't have to, you know, it can be anything and the satisfaction that you can gain from that, um, I think is significant. But, um, you know, in, 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 if we talk primarily, you know, just initially about the sort of motor vehicle trade, you know, the light vehicle technician is a plug and play person. Um, you know, a, a modern vehicle is designed to get, do thousands and hundred thousand miles and, you know, the part is broken, you replace it. Mm. And we need a, we need a fix it culture um, and a repair culture to make things more sustainable. You know, I mean, there's a green agenda there as well. Mm. Back to things been imported all the time from China. Well, you know, things will have got um, longevity designed into them if they're, if they're used correctly. So I think, you know, I think it comes back to skills primarily um, and the opportunities within, you know, the industry is vibrant. It really is. I think we have gone full circle. I think it's a really, really exciting time. Brilliant, thank you. Leah, um, obviously you're in the vehicle restoration department, so what for Heritage, you know, as well as being your kind of everyday, like everybody here, it's your everyday work, actually what's important for you about it? Well, for us, um, you know, we our, hands, our cars are hand-built, so it's those skills that um, our technicians have got, but having those skills passed on to the next generation is really really important and again we you know there's people who have got these types of cars and may may not may think that they're not valuable however nowadays you know because of the amount of skills and the the fact that they're hand built and the time and and all of that skill set that is needed to keep those cars and preserve them it's so important to keep that skill set going and move that on to on to the next generation um, and as we, we've got apprentice at the moment that that works with us and his his passion is is to keep those cars alive that's all he keeps saying you know it's about keeping those cars alive mm -hmm. um, and um, and also it's it's just nice for to see that that next generation learning these types of skill sets um, and then to be able to use them as they move forward interesting and Drew and your point Heritage, what can I say? With, without heritage, um, literally we are nothing. You, you can't learn anything if you don't have the past around you. You uh, imbibe people's brains by just having things around that they can learn. They'll walk past a wall, they'll walk past a car, they'll walk past a sign at a lamp. There is an effect. It, there's a part of that that will stick with you. So we need 
to make sure that we have the heritage skills around to, to make sure that these items are still there. What happens with that then, that, that tiny skill base, when somebody jumps on and goes, you know what, I'm gonna learn how to restore dry stone walls or gearboxes. It's not just about, it's not about restoring gearboxes and dry stone walls. You're gonna learn that, okay? You are gonna be really good at that. It's all the things you learn along the way. Why was it made that way? Who designed it? What was the crate it came in? What, where did that come from? Was it brought on, you know, a, a steam train? Did it come on horseback? You know, was the man who made that working by candlelight in the 1700s to create this incredible thing that you now are able to, to, to move forward again for the next 250 years? We must embrace our history. We must embrace it, and I mean fully embrace what we have. We have been at the height of design and manufacturing for the last 250 years in this country. Nobody else in the world can touch us for that time, okay? You have to go back to the, to, to after the antique and neoclassical, uh, sorry, classical, the classics, to get back to that. We need to embrace and fix and keep what we have. But for me, what it did for me, what Heritage did for me, I've been obsessed with it my whole life. It's not when I just learned to be a stained glass restorer, it was the 10,000 things I learned on the way to that. Mm. How to use a tape measure, how to put a scaffolding up, how to talk to Lord and Lady on their uppers who need us to fix their windows for no money, how to weld, you know, cast iron. Tiny things, how to, how to deal with different trades. All of these things matter. Once you get people involved with this, as long as you can pay them correctly, they'll stay put. And for me, it's giving people, making it real, making it an option for me is, is the thing. It always at the moment, it seems like, oh my God, he's a stained glass restorer. He's a furniture restorer. He's a, 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 an engine specialist for Aston Martin. If you make it an easy choice, right, and pay people properly, you, we're going to save everything. But we need to do it. We absolutely need to do it now because the generation that taught me were working in the 1940s and 50s when it was just stuff, right? And we're about to lose all of that. And we really, really mustn't. They are, get off the soapbox now. I could go on forever. All right. It's great. That's why we ask people to join us tonight. Uh, already, I mean, with each of you, and, and one of the, the great things about having you all gathered is that you're all in these different contexts. So you've got classic cars, you've got buildings, you've got history, you've got architecture, you've got all these, uh, you've got education, all these things. But there are some things that I think are emerging already. And um, interesting being the one um, member of the clergy here, for instance, is actually even for us, heritage, there is something important about heritage. If you go into a cathedral, um, there is something that is quite significant for me in going to a worship space where people for thousands of years have been and all the stories wrapped up in the people that have been part of that building and its its role so so even for me there's a, a kind of an understanding of that and an appreciate a need for it really um but one of, the, one of the first things i think that 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 i'd like to kind of bring up is heritage doesn't mean not green um, which some people might think because they might look back at particularly old cars or, or, or kind of trying to keep old things going. That doesn't seem very environmentally friendly. Surely we should buy behind the latest technology with the latest materials, blah, blah, blah. But actually heritage can mean green and does mean green in, in so many ways, doesn't it? Hannah, I mean, you, you picked up a little on that. Do you want to expand on that a little more? Yeah, I think heritage re in, in terms of building, reuse you know demolition is the most exceptionally wasteful activity um, and every time you you pour concrete every time you shove a building up with glass and silicon you are depleting natural resources um, you're usually using incredibly long supply chains um, and the carbon load is enormous um, whereas as drew was saying invariably things built um, a long time ago, built in the local vernacular with local skills um, for a particular reason. 
um, and built in a certain way for a particular reason. Um, there's a lot of embodied knowledge uh, actually about our landscape inherent in our built environment. Yes. Um, and yes. we're really losing that interplay and understanding of our natural environment. I mean, at its most simplistic, it's the idiotic building on floodplains. You know, our ancestors would never have done that because they actually had an understanding of how our built environment worked with, with nature. Um, so I think it is incredibly green and incredibly sustainable to reuse historic buildings. And there's a campaign being run at the moment called Retro First, which I'm heavily behind because at the moment, I don't know if, if you realize, but our VAT system works massively against the restoration of historic buildings. So if you have a crumbling building or, or even a, a perfectly okay building uh, of any era and you raise it to the ground completely so there is nothing left and you build a new build you pay zero percent VAT if you leave anything of that existing building standing to preserve it for sustainable reasons because you can reuse parts you pay a full whack of VAT mm -hmm. so we actually actively tax um, retrofit or, or reuse or recycling of buildings mm. which is utterly preposterous it's why you get so much of our built environment destroyed when it doesn't need to be and why we have to protect things through the listing system to prevent that happening mm. um, but we really need to see a redress at government level in in the taxation system before we actually interchange the dialogue before developers find it economical to reuse buildings um, and that's how you drive sustainability and new initiatives. You have to follow the money. Mm. That's all, always. Yeah. yeah. And um, for Leah and um, for Owen, I mean, your context predominantly is historic vehicles, um, uh, classic cars. Um, again, this doesn't mean that they're not green, does it? This keeping these amazing machines going. Um, do you either of you want to kind of touch a bit on that a bit more in detail? I'm looking at Leah, I'm not too sure if she's going to say something. I'm sorry, I was going for you, Owen. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, I think, I think there's a perception, isn't there, that people, you know, the general public or your, your media will portray a, a vintage car as something that, that is polluting because it's kicking out smoke out the back, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think there's a whole host within our industry of re-engineering um, a number of vehicles, a bit like uh, Hannah's point there, you know, reutilizing and re-engineering. Um, the EV agenda has become much, much more prevalent. And there's one or two people in our industry who say, oh, well, the EV is a dirty word. I mean, that's kind of, you know, a bit ironic, isn't it? It's like, wait a minute, is it or is it not, you know, using different power plants, existing vehicles. And we have, we have two apprentices, for example, in a local company in Oxford, Electrogenic, where, you know, they're re reusing um, uh, vintage vehicles, classic vehicles and re-engineering them. And it's back to the skills that I was talking about. You know, it's no coincidence that they want highly skilled um, apprentices with the right level of skills who can put that into practice. So I think um, there's a little bit of potential rebranding, I think, because I think there's a perception that everybody looks like Dominic with a beard and a woolly jumper. <laughs> and, you know, uh, <laughs> tweed hat and um you know, they, they pop, pop around the, the, the lanes of oxfordshire you know looking like a character of a roald dahl book you know um but but i think it's much much more than that and, and i think you know there's a, there's always this is this frustrates me there's a media perception of certain things you know uh the, the the media will say it's science well we put somebody in a lab coat with a pair of goggles and behind a test tube you know um it's a doctor must wear a white coat you know so how do we, how do we promote heritage um, linking it with skills, sustainability, re-engineering, redesigning, and picking up on Drew's points, um, you know, the things that we should be incredibly proud of, you know, people should be driving along, um, not in their tweed jacket with their flat cap, you know, making lots of smoke, but, but saying, look how proud I am of driving this, this piece of history. I mean, I borrowed a little, um, a little Austin 10 from Vista and, and brought it back into the village, and it was the most, one, it was great fun, but I took my, little, my daughters out in it, um, two of them in the front seat, shouldn't repeat that, but never mind. And, um, you know, we had people waving and there was this whole big thing around what, you know, there's history driving along. 
and it yeah. shouldn't be scorned upon, you know, and people will smile and wave. And, and I think, you know, you're saying, well, we're keeping history alive here, something, our heritage, we're proud of it. Um, and we're reutilizing technology, re-engineering parts, 3D printing parts, you know, refabricating parts, parts that you can no longer get. You know, mm. so actually if a vehicle has been sustained and, and somebody has remanufactured a part, then that should be celebrated as well. And there's an age old debate that Dominic, the likes of Dominic have all the time, you know, is it, is it new? Is it refurbished? Is it original? Well, it's still the same axe, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, it's still on, you know, it's still on the road, you know, let's celebrate that as well. So um, I know I'm probably upsetting one or two purists here, but uh, why not? I'm know? just imagining um, Dom as a kind of Roald Dahl character. Um, I, guess, I guess the only one I can think of is um, Fantastic Mr. Silver Fox. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're working on I was that. thinking of Danny, Danny uh, the Champion in the World. Who's the one the other <laughs> who with peasants in the back of his car? But, but can, I just, can I just chip in here? I think there is a big difference between, I think, I think the term green has now been adopted as an advertising ploy. Um, mm personally sustainability um and and green have never been so far apart as far as i'm concerned at the moment um it's just a marketing tool and one thing i'm very keen to do and i've talked to james noble at coventry motorfest is whether we can put something together um along the lines of family engineering history because i was i was incredibly keen to look at mine uh, my mother's family were um thing i'm very keen to do oh what happened there yeah it's all right carry on um i found my mother's family were all master masons who built churches um all over the new forest um another uncle was one of the first um engineer chauffeurs who was trained at rolls royce um you know it goes on and on and on and people have I love built heritage. Built heritage is absolutely fantastic, but people actually have far more connections within their family um, to engineering, whether they know it or not. And we need them to try and look back, um, engage with that, um, and then they might be more engaged with it moving forward. It's interesting. We've had a, a few, uh, we've got lots of comments coming in, and um, I'll try and feed some in as we go. Um, but um, taking up um, for instance, Hannah's point about buildings, um, somebody's put in, um, part of the issue though is that some of those heritage buildings are then reused as private residences, which then makes it difficult for businesses to enter into um, finding those buildings that they can use to promote the heritage of their business as well as the, the property that it, it's based from. Um, so that's an interesting thing um, in terms of just um, yeah, keeping those skills alive, keeping those um, industries going, but but it's difficult with perhaps some of the buildings that we we want to keep hold of that are being reused for um, for things like very posh dwelling places. Um, yeah, mm. I I think there are plenty of old buildings to go around. Okay. Um, I've I've personally just inherited an incredibly large estate of them. Um, I've got enormous buildings that are currently lying empty that I'm trying to find sustainable uses for and find businesses who want to engage and take the space. Um, I think the will is there. There are a lot of people looking for ways to use their buildings. Um, if people are vocal about wanting to do it, then um, it can easily be found. It's just that the hotels and things of this world actually have the money, the clout and the visibility, I suppose. But more often than not, it's people who have the custody of historic buildings desperately trying to find anybody willing to go with them on the journey, mm. rather than uh, trying to beat people off with a stick, frankly. <laughs> Anyone who wants one, please give me a call. <laughs> um, somebody said, sadly, we don't need an enormous building, um, which is a shame. Um, I, I have little ones. I also have little ones. I have ones. little ones too, so please. <laughs> end of the Come and play. <laughs> yeah, um, Leah, we were coming back to you because we, we were talking, in, uh, as Owen kind of mentioned, about old cars, old vehicles, um, and the green aspect. Um, how do you see that in your context? 
I think, well, for us, um, there's there's cars that we've had that have come in and maybe people have thought that, again, they're not, they're not worth restoring, but they're already there. The cars are already there. We're not, we're just putting the, the, the hard work and the effort back into it um, and putting back, using the skills that we've got in-house to be able to restore those cars and then get them back on the road. Um, we're not building brand new cars. The, the cars are already there, as I said. So um, I, 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 no, I, I don't. I, I think it's a, it's a positive thing that, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're restoring them and bringing those back to life. Yeah. But also being able to use new skill sets and, and also engage with um, education, the educational system as well, and and get the. The, the younger generation involved in bringing those bringing those cars back to life and them enjoying it as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Obviously, um, within all this, there's there is the issue of education. How do we transfer these skills um, in 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 all the different contexts that you you all work in, and and there are others too. You know, how do we transfer those skills? Um, we were talking just before we came on air. Uh, uh, about the fact that particularly for teenagers I've got um, uh, my son is um, 18 about to go off to uni and there is a, an extent and even when I was going to uni and that was a long time ago um, but there was this kind of the rite of passage was you did your A-levels you went to university and then when you you know you were lucky to get a job in something that you actually did your degree in um, and that seemed to be just the, the route that education establishments were pushing, that, that government was kind of pushing. But actually, we're talking about an education here that has a, um, a huge potential for the, the continuation of skills, aren't we, in, in all the contexts that you represent. Um, yeah. Can, can, I, can, I, can yeah. I jump in here? Yeah. Can I jump in here? If, if, if you go back one generation maybe yeah. a generation and a half right I was the, same thing. the universe the universe the, the university thing means nothing this country was built by 14 and 15 and 16 year old lads learning their trade the people would go off doing you know that the end of the grand tour and come back the reality of this is what we need to be doing is getting the kids who don't want to go off to university and say like me like I was a bloody useless in school. I'm not an idiot, but I didn't want to. I didn't. I don't need to know about oxbow leaks and, ame and amoebas. I don't need to know that. I wanted to 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 get my hands dirty. I wanted to get stuck in. Now you can look at this in any way you like, but if you get a 16 year old who's fed up with school and go, do you know what, mate? I'm going to give you a little bit of money and I'm going to teach you something, mm. and you can learn. Right? That's the key. That's the key. Reuse is also the key. This country was built by manual labour. They were just told what to do. The person that trained that 16-year-old, he probably started when he was 13. He would be 25 to 30, teaching that 16-year-old or that 15-year-old. We need to get back to that. And all we have to do is find the money to make sure these people can do that. It isn't an option right now that's easy. Pay them, and I keep going back to the money because I'm sorry, that is what runs all of this. If you pay these people properly, find and put together, a, a, you know, a, 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 the journey that can go, well, I can start here and I'm going to go there, right? But the best thing about an apprenticeship and the best thing about learning these skills is there's no ceiling, right? They're not going to get into a job where they can say, right, when I get there and I'm going to be a manager, manager. And then you get the Peter principle and all those other things kicking in. They're going to get to a point where they're going to teach more people. Okay. They're going to teach and then they're going to employ a blacksmith. They're going to employ a painter. They're going to employ a joiner. They're going to employ, you know, a restorer of all manner of things because you're going to learn so many things on your journey through. But what we need to do is grab hold of those kids, right? That would have been doing this a hundred, 200 years ago and put them into a modern context with some with, with some people of knowledge that's what we need to do we need to do that now we're missing a generation and if we're not careful we're going to miss a generation of old school restorers as well because trust me i know i deal with up to nine restorers every single day of the week seven days a week for the last 33 years we're losing them 
mm. and it's worrying and it bothers me. Owen, can I come to you and then Hannah? Because um, Owen stuck his hand up. Did you want to come in on that, Owen? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a problem within the education system as a whole. Because I think picking up your point, Adam, you know, the default route. And I've got a, a fifteen-year-old. My eldest daughter is fifteen, and the, the way the schools are configured. And I, like I said, I worked in, you know, in schools directly. It's it's GCSE, A levels, university for sixty to seventy percent of your cohort. Now, you know, degree apprenticeships, apprenticeships, traineeships, earn while you learn, yeah, cascading those skills down. They're not promoted by the schools. Um, but can, I, can, I say that's, can I say that's too difficult for your average 16-year-old and we need to stop that. You're already, you're already at that point shutting out 40 to 50% of the people who should be doing those jobs, right? Because you're you've got to have this and you've got to have that and a, this and an ology and a bit of paper. They're not going to do it. We just need to get these kids and give them a job in the industry. Don't say, well, if you do this and you jump through this and you get this bit of paper. No, absolutely not. Completely wrong. The absolute, the wrong thing to do. Just but get I, them working now. I think, I think the point, Drew, is, is that also that, you know, your PISA league tables. I mean, I'm a big fan of Michael Gove. Obviously, perhaps not, but, um, you know. Absolutely, barely, absolutely not. He's, he's a just awful, awful individual. I was joking. Um, <laughs> keep drinking the coffee, Drew. But, um, no, hey, I've won. Good. The, the league table system and, and where we are in a PISA league table is obviously more important to politicians rather than, you know, skills and, and making sure that we've got the sustainable skills within these industries that we're all talking about. But, uh, you know, training while you learn, earn while you learn, and apprenticeship, where it's a high-tech apprenticeship. I've got one of my ex-students, for example, who I regularly am in contact on, Vodaf um, on LinkedIn works at Vodafone, degree apprenticeship, distance learning with Lancaster Uni. He's on a good salary, back to Drew's point, and he is absolutely loving it. In, compar in comparison to his peers, who've had a pretty tough year in uni um, in the last year or so, and not too sure about a future job at the end of it, having a great time. So I think my point about traineeships, apprenticeships, cascading those skills down it can apply to the heritage industry or any industry and there has to be a significant sea change in schools and education to to to, to really open as many opportunities post 16 post 18 whatever age you might be we have a number of career changes as well people who are getting to a, a stage in their life where they're thinking i've been on the rat race for too long and i'm going to change and do something completely different because actually i'm going to get more job satisfaction out of it we've got one one uh, apprentice who's joined us this last week completely changed career and it's so refreshing to see it really is anyway over to you hannah sorry <laughs> before hannah comes in i want to talk to leah because um uh leah um, and property bridge have just recently taken on an um an apprentice so it'd be great to hear that story but uh, it's interesting reflecting back on my own school experience and i take drew's point but when i went to school and i told my um, careers teacher that I wanted to learn to beat aluminium panels to make it look like an Aston Martin he hadn't got the first clue about directing me in any way to where I might go and then when my head teacher found out that I wanted to be a panel beater at Aston Martin he threw his toys out of his pram and said oh no 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 you should be going to university now and it was really interesting how that mindset seemed to prevail when actually I would loved the idea of sitting there with a bit of aluminium banging on a, you know, um, which doesn't explain why I ended up doing what I'm doing. But, um, you know, it, it was frowned upon or it wasn't understood enough that, that people could then direct and say, OK, well, then what you need to do is you need to go to here or you need to talk to this person. Because nobody had a clue about it. Nobody understood it in that school system at the time. Um, but that's a, a point. Um, uh, Hannah, I'll come to you and then um, to Leah, if that's all right. What were you going to? Um, I think Drew's really right about curating the journey. So one of the things that we did in, in the construction sector, that we got a whole bunch of people together and had a big seven hour cross industry, cross sector um, punch up, basically, about how we could make things work properly. And... Um, one of the things that was identified was actually you need to you need to show young people 
actually what the trajectory is that you come in at 16 and this can happen then this can happen then this can happen and we need to be really honest about the salaries so we had a luxury flooring company there and the guy was saying i pay my top guys 80 grand a year you know if you turn around to a 16 year old and say right you work hard you become a master joiner you can fly to palaces in dubai and lay flooring at 80 grand a year brilliant yes. let's let's communicate that journey and show how we collectively are going to do that and as you say the skills are all running out and one of my major frustrations has been that lots of very well-meaning people think they're creating apprenticeships or opportunities clients say they're creating opportunities historic england and other bodies say they're creating opportunities but actually it all comes down to the same incredibly small diminishing pool of tradespeople who you're requiring to actually provide the training um, so what we identified last year and we were so near getting funding to kick it off the ground um, but unfortunately covid struck um, was the vision of creating a heritage skills academy for construction whereby young people would come in at the start they do the first six months or a year across all the trades to learn appreciation for all trades they then pick one they would then have the training in the academy so that you've got you know the right level of training and it's not all going on to one small subcontractor or you know specialist contractor who can't take more than two or three at a time um, and then you pass that apprenticeship or trainee around the network of contractors who've joined in and client bodies who've joined into this so that it's all spread but all the funding is pulled into one centralized resource we're pulling down on the apprenticeship levy and other sources of funding jointly um, and we are curating the journey of that person through the academy so that at the end of their four years or whatever it is they've got multiple experience across many different sites they've got an appreciation for all trades they've got the basic fundamentals of health and safety contract law everything that they need to know to then go out and be really productive members of um, of a building team um, and then that concept of the master craftsman comes back in so actually the pinnacle of your career is coming back to instruct at this college which i'm sure owen is is the model that that you guys are, are following as well it's creating that pride and that excellence um, and as you say giving people that vision and the journey and being really honest about the salaries that are out there because some of them are frankly huge nowadays um, I didn't know, for example, before I started on the, this discussion journey, that plasterers, when a big Hollywood blockbuster comes to town, all the plasterers cannot be found for love nor money in London um, because they all got, get dragged up to Pinewood to make film sets. I didn't know that the same people who do beautiful heritage restoration plastering build film sets. Um, and that's a major drain on resources. Obviously, if anybody would what, like... What's your paying a vicar £80,000, then I'm, I'm your man. What you've just described, Hannah, what you've just described is the journeyman. What you've just yeah. described is a, a, a very, very old journey that all apprentices really? would make. And you would happen in, in the trade I, I was trained in, you do seven years as the, your basic training, and then you, the, the training... Not, never finishes but 13 years is when you are uh, sort of accepted as as a restorer but you would be passed around the different trades in that as i was so i would be passed from a stonemason through to a man restoring the steelwork or the fermenter putting the guards up or another man who would be doing the uh, the lime rendering and pointing and these were all different points that i would have to go through in my apprenticeship but i didn't do it as, as a proper apprenticeship it was just stuff you had to learn to be able to get through that because it used to be separate jobs so you would go and be a the guy who just cut the glass and there was another guy who cut the lead and another guy who soldered the lead i think the progression you just described is exactly what we need to do we need to take the paperwork and the committees and the this you know that you have to have this and you have to have that get rid of it yeah. get rid of it let's go back to the basics don't try and reinvent the wheel 
I was lucky to be one of the, I think one of the, the last people without even knowing it to get a proper apprenticeship. Just a dyed in the wool, nothing special. It's just a job out of school, 16, 16 and four days, I'm on the floor working. We have to get back to that, simplify it. As soon as you go down the route of paperwork and all this other nonsense, you are going to lose a massive amount of talent. Now I was written off at 16, I was totally written off. The guy's an idiot, he doesn't know what he's doing, right? I, I lost my job at 23 um, because the guy who I worked for went bust, not his fault. Um, 13 years later, I, I had trained and employed 12 people full time. I had an apprenticeship scheme of my own and I was turning over nearly four million pounds as a restorer for uh, CADU, which is the Welsh branch of the English heritage. I was the only restorer ever to hold a CADU warrant, ever. I was the only one ever to have it. So all I would say is grab hold of these useless kids, don't think, know what they, you know, don't really know what they're doing and put them to work. We have a long heritage. Just because something in the last 25 years said, well, you need a, a certificate and you need this and you need that, rubbish. It's absolutely the wrong thing to do. If I can... Uh, it's, it's very, I find it massively annoying, massively annoying. If I can just cut in there, because um, I want to bring up um, Leah, um, who has just, as I say, recently taken on an apprentice. Just to say, before I talk to Leah, that there are lots of comments about the value of mentorship and actually going that full circle of the apprentice becoming the expert, uh, becoming the master craftsman, becoming the mentor again. Uh, this kind of almost 360 degree view of, of training, of learning, of working. Um, uh, so, um, Leah, can you give us a bit of um, the story about why you've taken on an apprentice, how that's been going and how um, that, that kind of 360 degree learning actually happens um, in, in practice? Yeah, um, well, I, as I just mentioned before, that I started off as an apprentice myself. Um, and then it was during lockdown, just going back in regards to our apprentice, during lockdown, the, um, we, we had an email over the weekend from a young 16 year old um, looking for an apprenticeship. So he was looking for it himself. And um, I responded to his email during the lockdown. And um, he, he said to me that a couple of businesses had actually rejected him and just said plainly no. Um, they weren't interested, um, but also um, some hadn't responded to him at all. So I think just on that point, it, it is important for us as businesses to also see that the our young ones are reaching out to us, but also to see the value in them in them um, making that effort um, to, to to do that because it's it's scary. It's scary as a sixteen year old. To, to be doing that, especially if you haven't got that support network behind you. Um, however, going back to our apprentice, um, he, we, we, we met him and we met him and he came in to see us, but we could see the drive and the passion that he had to work, to actually work in that industry. Um, so when he came in, he did do a, a little bit of a, um, a trial with us. So during that trial, he worked with the qualified technicians and the, what, what they, at the end of his trial, what he said, what they said to us was behaviours and his drive, his passion, the fact that he really, really wanted to be here. You could see all of that. We didn't look at his grades. We didn't look at any of those, any of the qualifications or anything that he had at the time because we wanted to know who he was um and and wanted to see what you know if, if he was able to learn those skills that the qualified technicians in the workshop were able to um hand down to him um he'd also was filling in a form that we created so the form was there to say um what 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 was it that he was learning with the technicians um and he was able to say um how confident he was whilst he was working with them on a task, whether he was confident enough to be able to deliver that task, what his knowledge was, and at the time it was limited. It was, a li it was limited as to what, um, what he knew. However, now when we look back at those, those forms that he's filled in now, we can see how 
his knowledge and confidence has grown since we've taken him on. Um, so I think in summary, what I wanted to say was, although schools also need to provide support for our younger generation and guide them into apprenticeships and other training outside of university as well, because they are just valuable to learn on the job. Also, as businesses, we need to see the value in our young ones and, and take the opportunity and, and take that risk with them as well. And when we do take them on, first of all, we might they might not benefit our business at that point in time. However, as we support them, mentor them, coach them throughout their life um, and develop them, um, as, as I think Hannah had said, you know, you can show them that you start here. However, as you develop and learn all these different skills, we've now got somebody who's a qualified technician, auto electrician, trimmer. Um, so all of those things at the moment we've got in house, he's been shown and gone through the different departments within the company um, and been shown those different skill sets. But that's what we need to do as employers and provide those opportunities for our younger ones. And it's actually, I mean, I know you and I have talked about this before, but one of the great things about the scheme that you have offered him and the structure that you've put behind the training is A, that he gets to see all the aspects of the business, including the office, um, which threw my head in, but that's just a personal thing. Um, but, but also your craftsmen who are already at their level are being able to kind of guide him and that's giving them a new skill isn't it it is it's it's been quite interesting to see them i'm going to use the word father him <laughs> because they're that you you see a different side to them they're taking their time their training they're, they're giving of themselves giving that knowledge taking um taking him to one side and it could be something really simple to to them or to us but actually this this apprentice is young and he's still learning so it's been lovely to see them to see a different side of the technicians as well um, as they're supporting this young person as he as he grows in his career mm, and it's interesting looking at some of the comments that are coming in there is a bit of kind of the reality is that there has to be a certain educational standard that people have to reach in order to get onto some training schemes um, whether that's a good thing or or not you know i mean um i guess like drew i'd love to see people who are you know who may not actually be educationally great at all given these opportunities because i think they're just valuable in their own right um, and they're still people um and, and knowing that i was you know it took me three times to get gcse maths um and, and I got so drunk on the, the last night that I actually got my maths. It was just a big celebration. But um, but actually, you know, I wasn't educationally great. And there are lots of people like that who, who even getting that bit of paper is a real struggle, a huge struggle. Mm. Um, I, can I, jump, I can jump in here again? What, what, um, what, what Leah just said about the young guy going through that and being mentored by the older men in there or women, whatever, um, is exactly what you want to do. What you've just said literally encompasses everything I'm trying to say. Uh, you learn so much more. If what, what, what happens, they give you, I was trained by, by two older guys in the stained glass side of things and then three older ones in the stone masonry, the design work and the, and the ferramenter and metal work. They give you so much rope. And if you're being a bit of a, you know, at 16, being a bit of a pain, right? They tell you. So you learn to also all of the skills of acting and being with other people. And a lot of these children don't have that now. And it certainly helped me. I wasn't academic, so I didn't find out, find out till I was 36. That was dyslexic, because you know, I went to school in the 1970s in North Wales in a valley comprehensive. So I'm not gonna learn anything. What you're doing there, is it, it, it must be applauded and i think we, we we do need to do that it is a journey let's make it an option for these kids let's make it easy for them let's you know the the bad kid the troublemaker occasionally can turn out to be really quite good at what he does that was me you know and we do need to grab that we do need to grab that now and i'm passionate about it 
I think no, also. Uh, sorry, it, I was going to just it, it, go on then. Sorry. Go on, Leah. It's also educating um, businesses as well that um, the, the certain the, the support that they will get along the way, um, the support for them, but also the support that's out there and available for the apprentice. And I know that. Um, Owen is, is doing a really good job with that, so I'll say thank you very much. Um, and, and, and that support is, is fantastic. So, but I do think there's, there's a lot of work still to be done with businesses to educate them, but also to work with schools um, to, to inform them of the different opportunities, especially in the automotive industry, that's available because I, as a youngster, I never was never given the opportunity to do an apprenticeship in, in the automotive industry when I would have really enjoyed to. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was certainly never pushed towards construction. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Owen, do you want to talk a little about the Heritage Skills of Academy and how it is that you are supporting the training of, of young people? Uh, yeah, I think when Helen was talking about setting up a centre of excellence and things like that, I mean, I think we've got a model that works. And, you know, I've been nodding a lot to, to comments that Drew's been saying and Hannah and, and Leah and things like that. And I think, you know, we have a block release programme. And um, in fact, just seeing our apprentices start at Brooklyn's yesterday, there's a whole range of different ages. And in fact, you know, there's, there's um, a 17 year old apprentice who's pretty much straight out of school and is actually down in Surrey, staying in residential accommodation in at the deep end and having to really move and shake. And, and in that respect, you know, the, com the confidence that he's having to develop um, and that level of competence that we're also having to develop, those soft skills are really, really important. And I think, um, you know, the mentoring that goes on either with us as an academy, with our development coaches and our tutors, the block release program and the ability to go back and work and train in the workplace and then come and refine those skills with us it is a, it is a it is a formula that works and it's over you know it's over three and a half years so at the end of the three and a half years and back to drew's point we do have a qualification and i think we've got to david tourney made mentioned it in the thread here that um you know you've got to maintain a standard yeah um so we have at the end of it we have something called an end point assessment um, and they have to do uh, a portfolio. So they demonstrate six pieces of work that they're incredibly proud of. Um, they can talk about and, and articulate. Um, so it's not, it's not red tape, but it's making sure they've got the level of competence so that it's, it maintains the level of, of quality work that we need to make sure that they are, you know, it's robust basically. And they do a professional discussion and they also do a skills assessment as well. So it's not, you know, exams, exams, exams but it's making sure that they're at the right level of, of skills, yeah? So they can then progress in the industry. And then people like Leah have the confidence in the apprentice scheme. I think that's really, really important. You know, over the last uh, 25 years, we talked about, and Drew, you said a good old fashioned apprenticeship. The employers that we work with, they're all saying what we are delivering is a good old fashioned apprenticeship is what they remembered when they came up through apprenticeships. But sadly, some of the, um, sausage factory colleges that are out there sorry um, you know they, they're churning out low value apprenticeships where and that that means that the confidence isn't there from the industry and they go well we've tried this before and um, oh it didn't work for us and then the, 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 the employers are looking at a ticking time bomb of a situation where they won't have the skills on the shop floor and sadly the skills will go to the grave so now it's what we're finding is that they're all going, actually, we need some of this. We need to do something. Otherwise, we won't exist in five or 10 years time. And I think it's, it's really galvanizing the industry now to recognize they've got to get the, the skills back in there. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've got a formula that works, you know, and in, in last year in the pandemic, you know, we, we grew from about 55 or 60 to 100 apprentices, which, you know, it, it's quite a percentage increase. And we're looking to increase by another 50 this year. And we believe if we work closely with the employers that they will um they'll work with us and we'll get the right formula i think you know it's hannah's model it's the model you said hannah you know um it's over a period of time learning from the trades people learning from the skilled people and coming out with with the skills that will survive in the future dom i know you wanted to come in but obviously you've been chatting loads tonight and we haven't been able to shut you up so um yeah. <laughs> that makes a change <laughs> uh, all i, all I all I wanted to say was I went a middle route to to some of this. I went into agriculture and did an HND. Um, I went into agriculture because I lived in North Norfolk 
and that's what all my mates did. Um, I didn't, I didn't enjoy school particularly. I was all right, um, but I then found out that that actually growing grapes is classed as agriculture. Um, so I started managing vineyards for people, and then I got trained as a winemaker by uh, a Chilean gentleman. Um, and while I was doing that, I... That sounds like something from a John le Carre novel, doesn't it? I <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, and it gets... Wait, and wait, it wait, get, where's this going? Have you uh, been yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, but, and it gets better. Um, I, <laughs> I, then, I then, through the vineyards, met a man called Michael Evis. And I managed it. And I managed the Glastonbury Robert. Festival site for three years. Um, and my 30s are a bit of a blur. Oh, sorry, my 20s, if I'm 30s as well. But it's about transferable skills. And if you look at our industry, whether it's boat building academy, whether it's coach building cars, whether it's rolling metal wings or electrics, all these skills um, are hugely transferable. Um, and I think heritage the one thing heritage has got to do is to keep relevant to the way things are moving forward and the way we stay relevant is to go out to kids and go look we are a part of your future and the reason we're a part of your future is and then go through all the the, the, the massive massive spectrum of stuff that they can do and i've worked in the construction trade for the last 20 years um and you know, Drew will, Drew will probably back me up on this. When you look at brickies or plasterers, those were the people who probably didn't do terribly well academically, uh, but are probably now earning the 80 to 100 grand that Hannah's talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are as wily as they come. So what we have got to do as, as, as heritage, in my particular view, is we've got to make ourselves relevant to their future if we're relevant they'll take notice it's really interesting you, you say that because we're getting a number of comments here from people who said either uh, they themselves their school experience was a negative one or or their children have not had the easiest school experiences and yet they've gone on to do some brilliant things um i remember when i was studying car design um, and it comes back to what you know Drew was saying uh, when he was um, diagnosed dyslexic. Uh, we had a couple of dyslexic guys whose 3D creation skills were second to none. They were absolutely brilliant. They were streets ahead, in fact, of, of some of the rest of us because they could think in 3D, which was just incredible. And as a designer, you need to be able to think in 3D. So, mm -hmm. so it's really interesting, actually, how what what our education system whether you agree with it or not though those they're not the be all and end all of people's growth and development Hannah. adam i completely agree with that and you know i've worked with guys um some of some of the best builders i've ever worked with could just look at an architectural plan and instantly see how it all fit together um they couldn't string a sentence together but my god they could understand visualization um, but I think it's really, really important that we don't take the rhetoric too far down the lane of, well, this is what you do if you can't do anything else. Because actually, it's really important that this is valued in and of itself, because this is a valuable thing to do, because this is something that's worthwhile. And it's absolutely for everybody. Um, you know, I find it quite frustrating, really. I came to construction mid-career you know mine wasn't quite as exotic as Dominic's but it certainly took some meanders on the way um did it involve great <laughs> yeah of the sparkling variety I'm afraid I, I did a stint at Sotheby's straight out of university oh. so that that was a beautiful blur um but you know I I was at the other end of the spectrum I was intensely academic and had scholarships at school and all that sort of thing and it it wasn't even a possibility that I could consider that sort of work, you know, and I found construction to be the most incredible and rewarding and fun career that I could ever have imagined. Mm. Um, so I think it's really important that we keep it broad and keep it open for, for everybody and, and don't 
use any language that can taint it as being the the thickies yes. you know thing yeah, right. or the one for the two for people who are too difficult although i will hold my hand up to being too difficult but you know it's it's a passion for anyone who has that passion um and a great career for absolutely anybody not just for those who can't get gcse maths and i go on drew and then i'll um, I, I hopefully I didn't come across as saying it's something for the thickies because it really, really isn't. Um, yeah. We have to go back. The, the education system as it stands now has only been in place since, in its current form, since the end of the Second World War. There's no reason why that is correct. It, it really isn't. Um, it isn't for the thickies. If you look at some of the geniuses of, of restoration of art and architecture, they can come from nothing or they can come from, from great knowledge and from great teaching. It doesn't really matter where they come from. It's just recognizing those people and grabbing them now. But the, you you have to have the people who can do it, and then you have to have the people, the rarities that come along, to have the vision. Mm. You need all of those things. We so we can't say no to anybody. I'm not saying you know, I'm saying yes to everybody. Mm. Absolutely. Think, yeah. But you are right. Give it. Give people the progression. Give people the progression. Show them. Say start here you never know what's going to happen. Look what's happened to me. I'm, I'm, I'm God, you know, thank God it did happen to me. I knew I could do something. I just didn't know what to do. And I had to do about nearly 20 years, really, before I really, really sort of got, got into a role on it. Let's I'm give these people the chance. I think I'm that's what we need to do. Let's try and find a way of giving people the chance. I'm still looking at what I'm supposed to do. But anyway, um, I mean, I think, like Drew, I'm not saying that uh, that these alternative training schemes, whether they're apprenticeships or, or other things, are for thickies. I think, though, that in the current system where we seem wrongly, I think, to value purely academic as the be all and end all, there are groups of people who maybe don't fit in that mould, but have the most amazing passion and potential skill set. And we can't see them as second class if they don't fit in that mold I think that was my point I quite agree with Hannah you know actually this should be for anybody anyone who's got a passion about it anyone who who is inspired by it um brilliant um but I think sometimes we um for for all kinds of reasons we 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 make um perceived judgments and actually um there are some people out there um you know who really did struggle in school but who will be absolutely amazing vehicle engineers who will be the types of people where they only have to listen to something to be able to tell you what's going on or what isn't going on um uh, and can i can i can i just jump in and tell you a very nice story here from danny hopkins who was who is the editor of practical classics magazine Danny introduced me to the most amazing guy called Nick McKenzie, who is one of our skills ambassadors. Nick is um, in charge of vehicle maintenance at Hammersmith and Fulham College. Um, and he, he predominantly on his courses had people who will have possibly done something a little bit naughty at some point in their early career. Um, they go in there on courses and they learn to fix bikes and mopeds and, you know, city-based stuff. And apparently Danny went down there one day, walked into the classroom. He said, full of kids who he normally would have crossed the road to avoid. Um, he said, and, and, and all of them were sitting there watching, listening to Nick. Um, he said, apart from one at the back, who was right at the back on his phone. So Danny said, he walked up to the other lads and said, look, you all seem, you know, happy here. What's with the lad at the back? And he, and they turned around to him and said, he's only been here two days. He hasn't got it yet. He said, and so it was a case of these, these kids, you know, naughty though they may have been, were being taught something that was relevant to their future. Mm -hmm. And I find that, I find that very refreshing that there are people out there doing jobs like that in quite difficult situations. And this is the one area I think that we haven't touched on, but actually Hannah said something about it right at the beginning. And, and we've talked about the, 
the potential for earning power and all of this, but actually the well-being of doing stuff like this for people who like to do this. Um, you know, one of the, I think the biggest things, that, and I keep up, this is a real passion of mine, is that I think because of lockdown, we are sitting on a mental health time bomb. And there's, it's ticking and bits are already going off. And as somebody involved in pastoral ministry, I've seen um, stuff happening. The, the wonder of this, potentially, if we uh, seeing young people trained up, getting people in stuff in the, they're passionate about, is actually the huge benefit to mental well-being and to their sense of self as they do this. Owen. Can I just give you another brief story? This is last week, so hot off the press. I mean, this is a cohort of apprentices who have been um, learning via Zoom for, you know, for two or three months or so. And they last did some practical just before Christmas and they came down to, to Brooklands and um, started doing some wheeling and shaping of metal. And one of the apprentices came up to me and just stopped me in the middle of the workshop and said, look, I've just taken this from this bent piece to this flat piece and back to this curved piece. And I spoke to Andy, who's our fantastic tutor down there. I said, what are you doing with them, Andy? And he said, I'm just letting them relax. I'm just letting them chill out. He said, I'm just letting them enjoy the moment. And there they all were, just enjoying it and taking pride in their work. And I think that is so, so important because... You know, they, they can feel the material they're shaping, they can, they can manipulate it, they can turn it from this to that. And there was the absolute pride. And, and day, just like we are now, we, you know, we spent too long in Zoom meetings and team meetings. Um, you know, some of them have been fantastic, this one especially. Um, but, uh, you know, they were getting away from the screen. And, and you can't beat that, that sense of pride in, in, in achieving something at the end of it. And, um, you know, they can't wait to come back in another five weeks. And they're just the difference was transformative in just the two days that I was there on the Monday, Tuesday with them. Today, I had the immense privilege of walking into our boat building academy um, and spending time on the shop floor. The students have come back over the last few weeks. And today, I saw the absolute joy on a young person's face mm. as they were working wood, um, making replacement parts for as they were sitting in a boat who had been present at the Battle of Jutland and they were working on her repair and you could feel the the joy and also the sense you know you could see that this person was actually enjoying the sense of history and really respecting it and reveling in it and if they lit up it was absolutely gorgeous just to sit and watch. Um, and, you know, you touched back at the beginning, Adam, you know, why heritage? Why is it important? Um, you know, that, that, that moment, the, the joy that you see on someone's face as they walk into a cathedral and you see them just breathe and you watch the shoulders just go for a second. Um, it's, an, it's an involuntary reaction of walking into, you know, whether you believe in it or not, it's a sacred space um, that's been built up from layers and layers of history and the same ritual taking place in the same space, which embeds itself into the fabric of the building and the space. Um, and it has a physical effect on people. You know, I do that when I get in my old car. I picked up my old car after not seeing it for six months yesterday. It's been down with some very lovely people being worked on. Um, and I got into it yesterday and I got in with my 15 year old daughter and both of us just went <sighs> and the smell and the you know um, both of us just looked at each other and went yeah this is this is good you know um, yeah. but but and, and that well-being that that's hugely hugely important Leah you were going to say something um, I was just going to say, just going back to um, with Owen was saying about um, the skills and the, the educational side. Um, I know that our apprentice, for example, does go off to Brooklands, um, but when, when he does his assessments on, on Zoom and he's achieved, some, he's achieved that assessment, he comes back and he wants to show us. He wants, he wants us to see that, that actually he's been working, man, manual working with, with the technicians in the workshop. They've signed off his work and then he's, he's actually then done, some, he's, he's then actually um, done an assessment which is linked to some of the work that he's been doing in the workshop. He's passed that assessment. 
he's overjoyed. He wants to, he wants to show us that. So even that is part of the well-being as well, that he, a sense of, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of achievement as well. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a sense of worth. Yes. A sense of worth. You weren't yes. worth anything. And I do think listening yeah. to all you guys, I find it, I find it, uh, um, it, it incredibly interesting. I think there's a halfway point somewhere between myself and Owen. I think there's, we need to find that point. You know, we need to find that point and give these kids, let's give these kids something. And if we can do it in any small part, just by talking about it, this is of benefit. This is of benefit, what we are doing. Yeah. Let's just not make it, let's not make it too difficult. Let's, let's make the journey a little bit easier. I got my job because I could lift a box of lead. It ain't, it ain't that easy anymore. It isn't that easy anymore. So, seriously, I could lift the box of lead where I started on a Monday morning. I don't know how to get to that to that place. Oh, I might do. You know, um, Dominic it, it might do. What what Leah's, Leah's doing is exactly right. I feel it's exactly right. You, you are helping those children in just just the right way, really well. Really good. I, actually, things like this, and, and obviously this is just one thing. I mean, Dom, um, I know we're we're kind of pushing nearly nine thirty, so I, I'm aware that people need to get some sleep. Um, uh, but um, I mean, this is why people like Dom has been kind of so instrumental in pushing this agenda. And it's an agenda we need to push wherever we're coming from it, because actually the more we raise our voices and the more we showcase how important this is, the more those that perhaps, or the hope is that the more those who are in um, positions of authority and leadership and where elsewhere will actually see the value in it more and more but unless we talk about it unless we raise it unless we shout it from the rooftops unless we show um uh, 16 year olds with a beaming smile on their face because they're bending a piece of wood um to restore a boat or whatever um if we don't do that then those who aren't listening won't get the message so Stop. what do we do next? so what do we do next that's the thing okay. we've spoken about it we've spoken about it we're all on the same page what do we do next? Yeah. Dom, do you want to talk a little about the AOHE and all of that stuff just to, so that people um, don't know? Uh, well, we I, think, I, think, I think in our world, um, I've made myself fairly well known. Um, what I have learned over the last 12 months um, from talking to people like the Heritage Alliance that I'm part of, and Hannah will know who they are, um, is that it's all very well preaching to the converted. It's not the converted we need to get to. We need to get to this new audience that Drew is talking about. Um, and we need to make people realize that it isn't a foregone conclusion that everything we love is just gonna disappear. Um, I would say, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest advantage heritage has over anything else at the moment is the tangible. We're all a bit bored with the virtual if I'm perfectly honest. Um, and there are so many people out there who I've had conversations with over lockdown who have said, you know what, if I was to drop dead tomorrow, no one would know I was on this planet. I haven't made anything, I haven't left anything, I haven't left my mark. He said, if you look at a church or a, a, a building or a, a car with a craftsman's name on the plate, there is a little bit of them left on the planet. And I think, mental health skills all that stuff the biggest advantage heritage has is we are tangible and we are tangible for achievement and that's what we need to work on i think um i need to bring this to an end um much as i'm loath to do so because it's been absolutely brilliant and the comments have just kept coming in and actually there's part of me that says we need to have a part two of this and that part two needs to be what Drew is saying in terms of actually what, what where, do we do? where do we go from here? Um, I will kind of stick my head up and go, um, Revs wants to be involved in where we go from here. Um, one of the key things about Revs has always, one of the key values is about restoration. Restoration of things, but also restoration of people. Um, and so um, I want to get involved. Um, and I want Revs to get involved. Um, and I'll keep shouting at you, Dom, until you let me, um, you silver. <laughs> <you>. um, 
Um, but actually, <laughs> there is a need, as, as Drew says, we can talk about it and we can shout about it, but actually we need to do stuff. So um, as we come to the end of this discussion, I'd like us to maybe commit at some stage um, to a part two, where we actually throw it open on this forum and say, what can we do? Um, and um, to then actually go ahead and do stuff um, and not just talk about it. Um, I'm aware that you guys are all doing stuff anyway, which is brilliant. I'm typical me, late to the party. But it would be great to have a part two, I think, and to, to actually make some, some kind of commitments, plans, whatever, if people are happy to do that. And again, involve the community so that because there are lots of people here who've chipped in, who are um, who own businesses, who are um, uh, training people, who you know, um, and it would be really good to to take a step forward from here, as 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 you've all said. Really, um, can I can I get your opinion on that? Yeah, go on, Leah. I'm happy to open my doors when when we can um, for you to come over, meet our apprentice, come and see some of the work that he's doing. Some, come and see some of the benefits that the, the business has also benefited from having an apprentice there. So um, that's that's my pledge. I'm happy to open Thank my you. doors for other businesses to come along and see us. Thank you. And uh, there's one part I was going to say, and I think I think we've all we've all fallen a little bit into the trap of what we've done. And I think it's really important that we listen to the voice of current apprentices yeah. or people trainees. And, and listen to their voice and I mean I recommend it I mean I did the I did an interview with three apprentices who back at Brooklyn's started last week it's a five minute clip but the joy that comes across Hannah was talking about that going down into the workshop their experiences why they're there what they're doing and their motivation yeah no disrespect to Dominic spending time at Worthy Farm I've heard that story before by the way yeah. um, but, um, <laughs> We need to make it about them and we need to give them a voice and we need to make them the spokespe spokespersons of, of their learning and their courses and what makes it special for them because they will connect with my daughters, you know, 11, 13 and 15, not Dominic with his beard. Yeah, all right. Sorry, Dominic. But my son, Owen, you know, you are in, you know, he is quite a spirited little beastie and, and in the same way, Drew talked about the beginning of his career. Oliver was the youngest in his year and was determined to start work on the last day of his 15th year so that he didn't have a bunch of old blokes telling him they'd all started at 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we're getting already people saying we would love a part two. And maybe there's a way that we need to factor in as to how we hear the voices of those who are currently training um, as well. Um, and maybe we can talk about how we go ahead and do that. Um, it doesn't have to come through a revs thing. It can come through 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 whatever, um, or a, a kind of uh, even at some stage when we can actually meet face to face and, and possibly, dare I say it, shake each other's hands. Um, uh, you know, to actually get I know um, Hannah's looking sharp there. Um, to actually get a group of us <laughs> <laughs> um, together and to thrash out this stuff and almost uh, then where do we go from here uh, including um you know um uh, those already training i think would be brilliant guys thank you very much i'm aware that we are at 9 30. to all those who've commented a huge thank you to you um it's been absolutely brilliant to see all these different experiences and comments please keep them coming in we will put this on the YouTube channel as well um, and um, we will keep you up to date with um, part two um, as and when we can kind of get that together um, but it would be brilliant to do that um, and just a huge thank you to everybody here on this panel it's been brilliant um, hearing you um, it's been inspiring it's been challenging um, and it's given us um, hopefully a direction um, to at least um, progress towards as well um, and a big thanks to Dom for um, putting it all together um, 
uh, and getting everybody's um, cooperation to get involved. So um, to all those who are tuning in, um, I love saying that, um, uh, um, thank you very much and we will see you. Um, just a couple of things to make you aware of before we um, go off air. Firstly on the 14th there's a webinar about the Rev story. People think that Rev's has been going for a year. This is actually our sixth year um, that we've been working on Rev's. And um, we wanted to tell you our story as we kind of look um, towards the end of lockdown and think about where Revs Limiter and Revs go in the future and how we can do positive, um, good stuff. And so um, uh, we're going to be sharing our story with you as part of that ongoing process of looking ahead and um, seeing what comes next. And talking about things that come next, on the 24th of April, which is a Saturday, that is our next virtual event day. I know that somebody mentioned that we're all sick to death with virtual stuff, I realize that. Um, but we are doing one more virtual um, uh, day, which you can all be involved in. It's called Rev's Jubilee. I've already had people saying, why have you called it Jubilee? It's got nothing to do with the Queen. Um, I know that, but actually if you look back in ancient history, so we're talking about as heritage as heritage can get, um, and particularly um, Old Testament stuff, the year of Jubilee happened every 50 years and it was a year of resetting and a year of looking ahead with hope and a year of embracing new opportunities as you moved from the past to something new. We think that that's a brilliant idea as we come towards hopefully the lifting of lockdown, we want to look ahead with hope. So we want to hear from every, people that have contributed to REVS, what's been good, what are you looking forward to, what are the projects you're working on and where are they at as the lockdown begins to lift. Are there specialists and businesses that want to put themselves back on people's radar as um, uh, hopefully um, things start to become a little freer? We'd love to give you a 10 minute free slot in order to do that and tell us about yourselves. Um, so that's going to be on the 24th. If you want to get in contact with us, usual address, revslimiter at gmail.com. Please get involved. You know the usual format by now. Um, but any questions, just give us a shout. So from me and the rest of the panel here, thank you so much. And um, see you soon. Uh, take care, stay safe, and God bless. Good night. Thank you.